Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that you hear me. The council and the members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Hemant Herat, the Deputy Director General Public Health Services, Dr. Razia Penze, the WHO representative to Sri Lanka, Professor Samat Dharmaratna, the consultant community physician, Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradaniya, Professor Vajira Bisanaika, the council and the members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, all other doctors who have gathered here. Let me, in, at the outset, very warmly welcome all of you for the webinar that's going to be commenced in a moment. The webinar that's going to be commenced will be on COVID-19 in Sri Lanka, perspectives on the state of play. We now have been living with COVID-19 for more than a year. As the way I see, we had ups and downs too, but in general, we have not done that bad. So they still let me things that this is the best time for us to review our performance and to plan for the future. So based on that, I have invited very eminent three speakers who would be introduced to you by our eminent, again, very eminent moderator. So let me introduce you my moderator to, for the day is Professor Vajra Disanayaka, Dean, Faculty of Medicine. And then let me ha hand him over the program to conduct it over the next one and a half year, hours. Over to you, Vajra. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam, uh, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we've um, gathered here this uh, uh, this evening uh, to a very important uh, webinar uh, to look at uh, where we stand in terms of uh, COVID-19 in Sri Lanka and um, reflect on the, uh, on the state of play as it were. Uh, for that, we've got uh, an eminent panel of uh, speakers this, after, uh, this evening. Uh, we've got um, Dr. We've got Dr. Hemant Herath, who, as we all know, has been spearheading uh, the COVID response uh, as the Deputy Director General of Public Health Services. Um, welcome, Dr. Herath. Uh, we are indeed uh, uh, very happy to have you, and uh, we are uh, very grateful to you for having uh, made the time uh, to join us. Uh, he will talk to us on um, the Ministry of Health in initiative and activities. Uh, he would be followed by um, Professor Samat Dharmaratna. Professor Dharmaratna is the Professor of Community Medicine at uh, University of Peradeniya. He is also the President-elect of our webinar. We are going to start uh, a medical association. Um, Professor Dharmaratna would talk to us on the public and community health outlook. I know he has been uh, in the thick of activities through the uh, College of Community Physicians as well, as well as through their own um, uh, group in Peradeniya, who've been looking at, um, um, at uh, what's been going on in the country um, uh, in a very, um, I should say, analytical way. Uh, so we look forward to his perspectives. And of course, it's always a pleasure uh, to have Dr. Razia Pense, the WHO representative in Sri Lanka uh, with us this evening. Rasia too is um, a very busy person uh, attending to all aspects of uh, the uh, COVID response in Sri Lanka. So Rasia, it's a pleasure to have you as well. And um, she will talk to us uh, and give some viewpoints on the way forward. So we'll begin with uh, the talks. Uh, we will, um, uh, first of all, allow our speakers uh, to make their presentations. 
and I would like to um, request the speakers to um, uh, try to restrict their present, uh, presentation to uh, 20 to 25 minutes, um, uh, more towards 20 than 25, so that uh, at the end, we would have sufficient time uh, to, um, for, uh, for questions and answers. Uh, we don't hope to go beyond 8.30. Uh, so, um, uh, we know everybody has, uh, is uh, back at home at, after a busy day of work, at a um, uh, busy day of work. And uh, so we'd like to keep the time and ensure uh, that as we promised, we finish this um, uh, webinar uh, in, a, uh, in one and a half um, hours, uh, no more than one and a half hours. So with those words, uh, may I uh, hand you over uh, to um, Dr. Hemanta uh, Herath. Um, Hemanta, um, you can share your screen and uh, if, uh, make your presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Vajira. Uh, Professor Vajira Disanayaka, uh, uh, the moderator. Uh, Madam uh, Padma Gunaratna, the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, Dr. Rasia Pense, uh, the WHO representative to Sri Lanka, uh, and my friend Samat, uh, Professor Samat Dharmaratna from the Department of Community Medicine of the uh, Peradini University. Uh, uh, first of all, I need to uh, thank the uh, council president and the council of the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for having invited me for this uh, important webinar to share our experience of the Ministry of Health uh, with this uh, eminent audience. And let me now uh, uh, share my presentation in the video. Uh, so I will be briefly touching that there had been a, a, a huge uh, quantity of activities uh, probably uh, went on with the uh, inception of this uh, disaster or this pandemic uh, in Sri Lanka as well as in other parts of the world. And uh, I will be very briefly uh, discussing the uh, very important uh, aspects of few activities that were carried out by the Ministry of Health. And uh, I will uh, let the audience to discuss uh, most of these activities at the end of my presentation or after the, uh, our presentation so that we can have a much more a lively discussion on the activities that we have carried out. Uh, in general, we know that this is the latest dashboard of the uh, epidemiology unit of the Ministry of Health. Uh, and uh, these are the figures that they have given. Uh, over 80,000 cases have been reported. And uh, currently, uh, there are uh, uh, 4,000 uh, 4, patients are under medical care and over 76,000 patients have recovered and over uh, 450 K, uh, people have died uh, uh, from the COVID-19 infection or related complications. And this is the other famous um, uh, graph you all may have already seen uh, uh, by the epidemiology unit. We had a very nice time, probably uh, very few cases and with occasional, uh, occasional uh, clusters, but from uh, October onward, 2020, we had this hectic time where uh, the relatively large number of cases reported on a daily basis because of few clusters that appeared uh, in the, especially in the Gampa district and uh, Kalambu Municipal Council area, followed uh, by uh, another few clusters uh, here and there from the BUI factories as well as in different parts of the Western province and some other parts of the, uh, some parts of the, uh, other parts of the island. And however, if you can just see the uh, pattern, uh, uh, we can see that uh, we have not seen any exponential growth of cases uh, uh, during this past four, three, four months. And that indicates that the number of cases 
the, the, the so-called so reproductive value of uh, our value of this epidemiological curve has not gone probably beyond uh, one, but it is going around above or below one. That is why this kind of uh, pattern has been, uh, I mean, appearing in these graphs. And uh, again, as uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratna very correctly pointed out, uh, we have not done that bad, but uh, we always feel that we could have done much better. So anyway, we will see what we have done. Uh, again, this is another graph uh, uh, indicating the, 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 uh, the the new cases versus the active cases. And currently uh, there is a, a very drastic reduction of active cases. And also uh, the, the, the total new daily cases are also have gone down to a great extent. Mm. And this is the geographic distribution. And we can see that in March, these yellow areas where not a single case is reported up to now and all through, uh, at the time of preparing this map, map and red area indicates that uh, the, the areas where uh, at least one case have been reported within the past 14 days at the time of preparing this map and green ones are the red ones which have become uh, free of uh, uh, cases up for the past 14 days where the, at the time of preparing this map. So what we can see is a uh, country was relatively free of disease in, at the beginning, but gradually cases went up and you can see a uh, 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 distribution of cases almost throughout the country, but there were a large number of areas uh, with uh, no cases reported up to that time. But gradually the, we were able to control those areas and gradually it became green that indicating that there had been cases but no more cases within the past um, 14 uh, days. And then now these are the latest ones. This is December 30th. The next one is uh, December, uh, January 12th. And the, this is the latest one uh, on February uh, 18th, where you can see that relatively large number of uh, cases uh, and uh, the cases have been distributed a relatively large area and at even at present the the, uh, the, the distribution is actively or uh, the uh, transmission is going on in these places uh, except for few areas and by now almost all areas of the country have had at least one case except for very few division emerge areas indicated in the last map and what are the activities that I have, we have carried out at the ministry? We have a, a very uh, huge set of activities that carried out. I will try to give, briefly describe all these activities one by one. Uh, firstly, the international vigilance that uh, about the international distribution of cases, IHR related activities with the WHO, uh, and also we, mon we were monitoring the uh, distribution of variants, different variants of the, uh, the virus and emergence of new variants. And also we were watching the best practices, uh, especially the countries who were um, uh, performing well, as well as the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the countries who have mm -hmm. Uh, demonstrated uh, effective control activities and also the new developments, especially the prevention of protection and protection that is basically the vaccines and other preventive activities that they, uh, they were developed in many parts of the country, world, and also the diagnostic methods. We know that there are different types of diagnostic methods, PCR, then the LAMP PCR, and also the rapid antigen tests, tests have been developed over the past many uh, uh, months. And also probable treatment uh, possibilities are also, we have been uh, watching and then we were trying to adapt them. And at the ports of entry, the first important thing that we did was to limit the entry of uh, persons through the ports of entry. And uh, we had a kind of surveillance at the port of entry. Uh, basically, we know the type of entry were first 
Recently, the repatriation or and these people were quarantined both in government and hotel quarantine centers. And also the next type of people who are coming to Sri Lanka at this moment is tourists. And we have the hotel quarantine and also uh, the movement, their movement is carried out under biosecurity bubble. And also there are a large number of seafarers uh, either returning to Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan seafarers, or uh, moving uh, seafarers from one ship to the other through use in Sri Lanka uh, airports, ports, uh, and these are also carried out uh, under very under strict control measures. Airline, airline crews are the other important uh, type of persons who will be at risk and probably having a risk of getting the disease into the country, and we are managing them separately. Special, uh, those who are coming for medical care, there are different, especially from Maldives and also to some extent seashells, people used to come to Sri Lanka for medical care, and we had to allow them and we manage them in a way so that the minimal risk to the country. Uh, and also special passengers like those who are coming for special technical reasons, uh, important activities, for example, to repair the PCR machines of the, the health ministry. When we need this kind of passengers, we had to uh, do take special care to manage, make sure that they are coming and then they, might, they are not in a position to put them into quarantine and we had to um, look after them in a different way. And also, VIPs like the others uh, uh, now we recently also uh, um, uh, the Pakistan Prime Minister came and there had been other VIPs coming uh, in the past also and we had to allow them accommodate them and manage them uh, without uh, the with lowest risk to the public of the Sri Lanka. And at the port of entry, we do the, the health declaration is required by the passengers and also thermal screening is done to screen them. And at the field, once the information comes from the uh, probably the repatriation passengers, the tourists, then other passengers, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the field level surveillance is carried out and the, uh, the, the field level staff do the, um, the, the entry PCR, exit PCR for quarantine passengers. And also they do the random testing at the community and work settings and also other specific areas. And also we have a hospital surveillance systems, both uh, uh, the established one, the influenza like in ILI surveillance, plus the SARI or severe acute respiratory infection. All these surveillance activities were intended to uh, detect cases uh, as quickly as possible so that they can be isolated and prevent further spread. And the case detection part, we can divide, divide into active case detection and passive case detection. Mainly at the port of entry or at the quarantine centers, we do the entry PCR and exit PCR. And also we do the contact tracing for the immediate contacts and then we do the PCR test. Or those who are undergoing the home quarantine before exit, they, they have to do undergo a PCR test. All this, and also there are a large number of people who are subjected to uh, PCR screening prior to medical procedures and uh, admission to different uh, hospitals and other things. So by these things, we actively detect cases. And passive case detection is so taking place in, to some extent in outpatients department. And uh, uh, that is also another important aspect. Again, uh, I'm trying to give the brief about one of the most important aspects is the treatment of, of uh, positive patients. We have 85 treatment centers up at this moment. Current capacity is about 12,752. And out of which today, or by yesterday, there were around uh, 500. 184, uh, 5,854 uh, bits have been in, in use. And uh, by yesterday, it was uh, 25 bits were in use. And this is the not very clear, but for the screening, uh, those who are closer to the screen can either be seen uh, probably the number of uh, the distribution of these uh, uh, um, uh, treatment centers. And the, uh, the graph on your right side indicates the number of beds uh, used and um, uh, available. And you can see that the green bars are the available bits and the red bars are the, you know, the bits 
uh, in use at this moment and we have a relatively large number of beds available and this is how the number of treatment centers increased over the time uh, and at the present we have around 85 treatment centers and this is the number of beds uh, total number of beds are given in the the black line and the uh, number of uh, beds occupied at the given time is in the, uh, the this maroon or uh, purple line and uh, currently there is a relatively large gap between the total number and the currently in use but we are we need to be cannot be complacent and we are we want to maintain a buffer area as much as possible because we do not know what would be the consequences in the coming days and contact tracing and quarantining is done once the patients are detected and done by the field health staff supported by the epidemic and also other agencies like state intelligence services and other uh, different organizations uh, the quarantining current strategy is uh, home quarantining. Initially, we did the institutional quarantine when the small number of cases are, uh, contacts are identified. But nowadays, we do the home quarantine. And it is one of the, the not quarantining, but the uh, detecting, tracing the contacts, and then uh, identifying them and making sure that they are uh, uh, strictly uh, uh, undergoing home quarantine is one of the most challenging process uh, in the current COVID control activities. And testing, we know that the PCR is the gold standard and PCR testing, for PCR testing, samples are collected from on arrival passengers, foreign travelers, on ex uh, exit from those who are under, under quarantine and also from general public, random community sampling and from workplaces, routine surveillance uh, carried out, immediate contacts of knowing, not known COVID patients and uh, high risk patients before discharge uh, of uh, among the patients. Mm, these are the uh, few areas where the samples are collected and around 30 laboratories are functioning as of today, yesterday. And there is an application, computer, uh, the app, uh, uh, Supariksha app developed by some of our uh, bioinformatic uh, doctors. And we are trying to uh, use this app to expedite the the the, the laboratory uh, sample sample uh, test test uh, the the information sharing so that uh, without I mean the to minimize the delay of reporting such uh, laboratory test reports and also the rapid antibody test is also being uh, carried out and the number the 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 the, the their um, place is uh, not that uh, valuable compared to the, 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 the expectation that were given to us initially. But however, the antibody tests are also being carried out. And also there is a notion, uh, most of the time people are telling that the number of cases are going in parallel with the, um, uh, the number of PCR tests done. This graph indicates that uh, you can see that the two uh, scales are there. Uh, the left side is the number of PCR tests and the right side is the number of um, positive uh, cases. And uh, 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 we are. We know that in most occasions these numbers are going in parallel, uh, basically because the uh, when it is contact tracing, when the large number of cases are found, large number of contacts are also tested, and out of them, the large number of uh, um, uh, positives are also found. But this is not the case in all the time. You can see that when the numbers are going parallelly, huge number of increases and also huge reductions are also seen. So there are many multifactorial uh, the thing. It is not really directly related to the number of tests done. And also the management of COVID deaths. Again, it is done according to the gazetted guidelines and it is a uh, now public law and um, the technical committee is appointed by the uh, appointed by the secretary ministry of health and that committee reviews the guidelines periodically to uh, decide whether uh, do whether to do any changes or not 
and also it's a huge uh, activity behind the screen for the logistic supports for the uh, supply of uh, personal protective equipments laboratory consumables the storage of such activity the procurement is a huge uh, challenge uh, the, because the items are not available in most, sometimes uh, the suppliers are uh, very difficult to get uh, provide uh, or the supply the items in quantities that we require and also transport the pro personal protection equipment lab items pcr samples and the people patients the quarantine people the, the repatriated people the, those who are discharged need to be brought back to their home and the transport is another huge operation that is being carried out by the ministry of health together with other stakeholders and also management of quarantine facilities at present the largest number of quarantine facilities are managed by the uh, sri lanka army and to some extent other uh, navy and air force and police but um, health ministry also maintaining a few uh, facilities uh, for the health ministry staff and uh, uh, again, that includes our activities. Uh, risk communication, again, it is carried out by the Health Promotion Bureau and it has a functioning uh, a call center for public relations where the public grievances, request clarifications are um, discussed and proper uh, information is carried out. And then uh, at uh, regular intervals, the press communications are issued and press uh, conferences are held and that activities are carried out. But the same thing is carried out by other agencies as well. And the monitoring of an evaluation of the activities basically the cases are monitored by the epidemiology unit the contacts quarantine activities as well as other related activities the hospitals and their treatment facilities are monitored by the deputy director general medical services and the laboratory activities are monitored and by the uh, laboratory services and overall uh, uh, activities are monitored in, on, for the, on behalf of the Secretary, Ministry of Health and the Director General by the Disaster Preparedness and Response Division of the Ministry, uh, where um, the daily reports are generated and disseminated among the key officials of the Ministry of Health. And also, we had a, um, a, a monitoring process for uh, the, the general activities in the field uh, through the RDHS data and also hospitals data to see whether uh, identified activities are carrying to the satisfaction of the health ministry. And you can see in these dashboards, the red areas are the areas which are not carried out very properly, probably to the up to the expectation. Uh, the green are the ones that are carried out to the satisfaction of the, uh, the, the order up to the expectation. So we wanted to uh, um, change the situation. And you can see that initially in April 23 and 28, the things have changed. And I could not get the recent uh, screenshots of these activities. But this is also carried out. And also we had a uh, evaluation wise, we had a uh, internal interim review completed, recommendations are presented to the Secretary Ministry of Health and some of the recommendations are already implemented. And these are the areas which we discussed in this hour, uh, uh, almost all 15 areas were discussed. And the vaccination program again started on 27th of January and almost 366,000 uh, uh, persons have been immunized and new stocks is expected tomorrow and uh, we can see uh, we will be able to continue this. And the last thing is the uh, reaching the new normal. Uh, we you know that very long ago the advocacy brief was developed the instruction notes were uh, prepared and available in the website and uh, assurance forms are introduced. And now the, in the process of uh, social marketing of the dream campaign and uh, we know that uh, um, there are uh, small, small hiccups but uh, it is also so gradually uh, progressing. So these are some of the pictures of this thing and Colombo base hospital malaria, how it was developed into a state-of-the-art laboratory and other things, mm -hmm. and also the improvements in the uh, Institute of uh, uh, Infectious Diseases, IDH, and also uh, in the treatment center at Iranavila, uh, 
where the uh, the, the treatment center has been prepared, uh, uh, developed uh, using the old uh, VOA uh, relay station and also VH Velikanda where another uh, hospital was developed. And uh, I think that concludes my presentation. Once again, I would like to thank the, um, uh, the, the Sri Lanka Medical Association for having invited me and also uh, all the audience for uh, for patient uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Hemant Herat, uh, for um, uh, that uh, overview. Uh, in the interest of time, let's move on to the uh, next presentation, which is by uh, uh, Professor Samat Dharmaratna. I've already in introduced him at the beginning. So over to you, Samat. Um, would you like to share your screen and then uh, begin your presentation? Thank you, Mujira. Uh, you can hear and see this. Uh, so, uh, Professor Vajra, yes. this and I, yeah. the moderator for today. Uh, and uh, would like to thank the President and the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting me for this webinar. Thank you, Vajira, for your kind words of introduction. And uh, my main objective of this is uh, basically the topic given to me was public and community health outlook. So definitely public and community have an outlook about the disease. So to give an introduction, I am the head and chair professor of community medicine and I am also the director of the Health Emergency and Disaster Management Training Center at the Faculty of Medicine University of Taiwan. And as Vajira uh, said, I have been uh, doing various things uh, since the beginning of this epidemic. Uh, to see what is kind of happening. And uh, so, what is COVID-19? Everyone knows, uh, Dr. Hemant Herat, my schoolmate, we were in the same parallel classes, we were in the same batch, and it was really nice, both of you. So we have two thirds majority also today uh, to do this presentation. So we may have to live with COVID-19 for years to come. So let's not deny it or panic. Let's not make our life useless. Let's learn to live with this fact. And washing hands and maintaining physical distance is best method for prevention. So I'm a public health person. We always talk about prevention is better than cure. So I and a lot of people think prevention is the only treatment for COVID-19 still. So do social distancing, wash hands. Do not touch your face. If you want to touch, scratch your face, wash your hands and do that and wear a face mask. So this I think uh, Dr. Herat showed, but uh, basically we are our daily new cases and then the recoveries are going parallel. So a number in hospitals are reducing. So this is up to February 22nd. There were 450 deaths. By 24th, there have been 453 deaths. At this time, there were this much of people. But again, when there are large numbers in hospitals, our beds are slowly becoming uh, saturated. Then this is the confirmed, basically, uh, daily new cases. So as uh, Dr. Herat said, uh, in the past few days, our cases are New cases have been going down, so good, most probably. And daily deaths have been fluctuating since about October. We didn't have uh, that much, but then it started coming. We had 13 cases one day, the largest number today. We have uh, basically seen and then uh, another 10, but all the other days has been less than 10, but it is there. And then the total deaths have are slowly increasing. We have 453 deaths today. So daily diagnosed numbers reducing good. There were 4,225 patients by 22nd in hospitals taking treatment. Number of deaths are fluctuating. Requirements for beds to manage is high. Could be going up. So 
go to the community my topic effects on the community are multifactorial and it is huge so this basically can be sort of categorized under social economical cultural political psychological and other the social effects include in addition to many education and health so schools have been closed uh, children are getting totally sick staying at home in patients are going uh, parents are going sort of mad keeping the children so this is affected health everyone knows so schools started children started coming but still they are scared parents are scared and the children don't know the real significance of wearing a mask so they put the mask down play with the mask and do various things could be sort of foci for spread if it occurs then economical effects were huge it was very not only individual but it was national and global devastating and everyone knows what happened to the world a lot of airlines basically had to ground majority of the aircraft including lo and a lot of businesses were affected causing economical problem this is uh, a area of huge economic activity in sri lanka but there is no activity here due to covid so all these shops are closed a lot of people live earn their living eat from this money so don't know what is happening and then there are huge cultural effects due to quarantining so suddenly you have to go to quarantine whether you have a place the it is culturally appropriate then institutionalizing a lot of people do like hospitalization and death so where if a person dies one of your relatives you can't have a funeral uh, bodies basically taken away you can't have a wedding you can't do various things now because of a lot of regulations so those are all affecting individual you know the political effects they are varied and beyond this discussion but uh, this is during the lockdown so no one could move anywhere this was putting pressure on politicians and this is also they had to stop or sort of imprison a lot of people when suddenly they had to lock down so there was back pressure on everyone and then definitely psychological effects they cause devastating consequences to the person the family and the community so if you can remember during the first phase a lot of people's biggest problem was or uh, biggest fear was not getting the disease but if you get the disease and the whole family is quarantined we have to keep your pets and what is going to happen to the house whether the house will be broken into so this is still going on now a lot of people's mind so more than falling ill with covid people are worried about what is going to happen if one family member falls ill or is detected so psychologically everyone is affected uh, remember we have been under this strain for now you know, nearly a year and see the daily earners were seriously affected they could earn they had to beg or they had to get free food and this is causing everyone stress unhappiness and psychological effects and then other effects huge problems stress sleep sleep less nights and psychological issues to everyone including policy makers so dr herat very clearly said how much of trouble he has been going through during this one year sort of trying to keep us safe and general public and patients everyone is having problems and so this is uh, suddenly when the country was open and then people had to go and shop so the people who sell have to sell and people had to go and buy no social distancing and again issues every day continuous we will not be able to survive this and these effects might make people to hide the disease and increase the spread so the biggest issue is so because people are scared to fall ill Uh, or to be detected because of quarantining and various regulations and suddenly uh, you are, you are being made to go to 
hospital and quarantine centers, people sort of try to not get the PCR done now. Even if you get the PCR done now, if you have symptoms, not to tell. So this might be, uh, or this might affect the spread. And then the face mask has basically brought a new era uh, to our society, to the community, to the people. So the only thing uh, we used was to get free air. Yeah, now we have to get it to a face mask, but the community public, general public, a lot of people have a lot of issues with the face mask. How to use, basically how to put it. Then a lot of people bring it down and wear it in your chin and then you can transmit in addition to the corona, a lot of things. And then we have to keep while going from home to the workplace and in the workplace, when you have to eat, a lot of people keep it on the table and then you uh, put it back, you might uh, sort of transmit infection. Then reuse, so you know some masks you can reuse, how to store, so you where it to work or where it to school, come back, then where to keep, how to store, and then how to transport, so a lot of us suddenly take it and put it in our pocket or in our handbag, and most importantly, the cost. So now a lot of masks have come down to about 20 rupees per mask, but say uh, five member family, they will need about two masks per day. That is 10 masks, that is 200 rupees per day. And 200 into say they work for five years, five days per week, then that is 200 into five is 1,000. That means four weeks per month, they will need an additional 4,000 rupees for masks, but now rather than additional, we have most probably the, especially day earners income has gone down, not up. And on the down uh, economic cost to add another 4,000 rupees is sort of will be a little problematic. So face masks could prevent the disease, but there are other problems. And because of that, people are slowly tending to use sort of not very good mass and then reuse mass where they cannot be reused, some wash mass which cannot be washed. And with this long term, who knows, we might get a lot of respiratory diseases, respiratory problem, respiratory tract issues uh, in addition to not getting COVID. And this you would have seen, everyone does watch TV, everyone do this, watch a football match, then the coaches touch the mask on the uh, in front of the face. Uh, film stars do, politicians do, everyone do, and this continues. And this is what you shouldn't do because the the yeah. virus, if it is in your fingers, can go through the mask and you can get infected. So if you put a mask, please don't touch the mask. If you want to touch, only touch from the sort of near your, the handles of the mask or near your ears, that is the only place you are allowed to touch a mask, not this way. Please don't do this. And then vaccine came. What do the public and the community actually know about the vaccine? A lot of people think that the vaccine will prevent the disease. Prevent the disease, prevent the disease, or prevent you from getting the disease as well as prevent others getting the disease or prevent spread. Therefore, everyone wanted false expectations, mass hysteria, but do actually the vaccine do this? So I think the vaccine only prevents you getting severe disease and death. It does not prevent you getting the disease. So this information need to be given to the public. Still, there is this information gap where the public thinks that this vaccine is sort of uh, the, the, the what you are expecting and you get the vaccine and then you won't get the disease, then you can start going on trips and going on social sort of gathering, going to parties. So people are waiting for that, but actually it is not that. And if we don't tell this to people uh, in advance, there'll be a lot of bad issues. Spread might actually even increase. So this, the okay, that said, Almost all the healthcare workers have been vaccinated. And uh, so we have got, and again, reiterating prevention is the only treatment for COVID-19, social distancing. 
wash hands, do not touch your face, wear a face mask. Again, children started going to school. Let's stop coronavirus. Hope we can do it. I think I, as well as a lot of us, are getting really sick of this. The healthcare workers, including Dr. Herat, have been doing this for one year, so most probably they might be getting sicker than us doing this. And uh, so they might break down if this continues. So hope that we will be able to stop this. And this just a question I suddenly thought. Uh, so I am an academic person. I give homework. So this is kind of homework. We stop doing PCR. Say sudden. So so the government decides not to do PCR. What will happen? So clues majority are asymptomatic. There are few deaths, and more deaths are related to COVID-19, but are not caused by COVID-19. So you can do this when you don't have anything else to do. And uh, so thank you. These are the people, including I'm a public health person, so medical officers of health and public health inspectors, and our staff have been going around the country for one year, more than a year, doing PCRs, getting shouted at, getting chased away, and doing this tirelessly, no, com no basically uh, complaints, and uh, thank them, and thank you all for listening to me, and thank the President, Dr. Padma Gundatna of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Council again for inviting me. My main objective of this was to start you talking, start a discussion, start an argument, so we can uh, sort of get answers to this. As Dr. Herat said, the government has been successfully, in my opinion, under uh, low resources. We are a developing country, have done a marvelous program for prevention of COVID to keep us safe. Yes, there have been small, small issues, deficiencies, mistakes, but rather than criticizing or talking about mistakes, I think uh, we should talk about our successes. So Dr. Herat, uh, basically one person who has been in the forefront doing this. And uh, so again, thanks uh, for everything, the government of Sri Lanka, Ministry of Health and all the healthcare workers for helping and keeping us free. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dharma Ratna uh, for that presentation, which touched on uh, a lot of aspects um, from the point of view of the public and the community, and also the uh, ongoing challenges uh, that we face um, uh, in uh, uh, public health measures. Uh, um, as you said, uh, you know, we've got to focus on uh, uh, the positives that we've um, achieved. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, uh, amidst lots of challenges and it's to the credit of everyone that um, uh, we are here where we are. I, I mean, I can tell you uh, from a personal perspective, uh, having been the president of the Commonwealth Medical Association, I get the opportunity to talk with a uh, lot of people from across the Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I find um, from the a developing part of the Commonwealth, which is the majority of the countries, uh, I'm the only one to have had uh, the vaccine. Um, and so, uh, so we are lucky in Sri Lanka that um, uh, at, that we've um, uh, we've had the vaccine. Um, so that is for some uh, parts of the world, it's a it's a dream. Um, so we've um, we are in much better place than most parts of the world. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Rasya Pense. Rasya, I've already um, introduced you at the beginning. I wonder whether you were there when I did. Um, so welcome. It's always a pleasure to um, have you at our forums, uh, Rasya, and uh, to listen to you. Um, uh, so over to you. Uh, please do go ahead and share your screen and uh, make your presentation. If there are, um, if any of the participants have any questions uh, for our uh, uh, previous panelists? Um, you may raise your hand, uh, ask question on the chat, or mm -hmm. so doc, to Dr. Hale, uh, I'm picking up a question from the chat. If uh, 
you are not prevented. Um, uh, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting the infection. Why does it, uh, uh, you know, why is it called a vaccine? Yeah. Anyone of our panelists would like to answer that? Yes, uh, yeah. yeah uh, there is uh, probably I'm not the best person to answer that question, Vajira, but probably there are so many microbiologists and other people who are among the audience would be better uh, explain the situation, but probably this is uh, uh, kind of uh, you know, what is, uh, I mean, the available information indicates that uh, once the vaccination is uh, response in the body and then at least the, 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 the patient will be prevented from getting into serious complications because of the immune response. And uh, uh, again, uh, I what was uh, uh, told by these experts to us is that uh, it, the vaccination itself is not going to prevent any nas nasal colonization and thereby the spread of the disease will not uh, 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 I mean, or reduced to the extra. I think the data indicates that when a large number of uh, people or population is uh, uh, immunized, there will be a, a kind of uh, effect on the transmission as well. So we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think that is the probable answer that I can give at my level. Thank you. We'll uh, get back to that. Uh, is the uh, screen all right, uh, Vajira? Yes. Uh, yeah, we can, we can yeah. see the screen now. We can see the screen. So you can play uh, the uh, presentation. Rasia, uh, are you ready with the... Yes. Uh, sorry about that. So Dr. Padma will uh, screen the presentation for me. Thank you, Dr. Padma. Welcome. So, uh, in terms of um, COVID-19 lessons learned and what next, I think so what we heard from the first two presentations, this provides a good segue into what next. So, what I thought was to start with what, what have we learned, you know, slightly over a year into the pandemic. And some of the key lessons that kind of uh, pop out are the interconnected destinies and the interconnected of health economies and societies. The pandemic has left no country or no uh, section of the society untouched. It has disrupted uh, economies. It has disrupted lives, livelihoods, and uh, even the best of the health systems, the strongest of economies, the virus has brought them to its knees. And it has also brought home uh, the revelation that most of our indices and the metrics that we used for uh, measuring the health system's preparedness and the strength and resilience actually fell flat when the pandemic came. It also brought home uh, the realization that how unprepared the world was for a pandemic, despite the alarm calls that were you know, raised much ahead of the pandemic. But perhaps you know, the political and the global commitment and solidarity that was needed fell seriously short. It also brought home uh, is there something wrong? Okay. It also brought home the point uh, about, you know, the power of science and collaboration. Within weeks of uh, reporting of the new virus, we already had the genomic sequencing done. The speed with which diagnostics were developed was a feat of science. The speed with which the vaccines were developed because the genomic sequence came in January and March of 2020, there were already uh, studies underway for vaccines. And one year into the pandemic, we already have safe and efficacious vaccines. Uh, and also about the collaboration, the, the speed with which the research and studies were, were circulated and the, you know, all the paywalls that was brought down. So use of um, the, the, the media, uh, the internet to, to rapidly disperse information, that was also, um, I mean, it was seen to be believed. 
it also brought home the point that while you know those rigorous there, there were mainly uh, preprints and pre-reviewed publications were also there uh, there were also initially gaps in terms of um, getting the science right but in, at the end of the day there was a lot of global collaboration to get uh, to understand the new virus how it was evolving what were the new diagnostics, the therapeutics, uh, the whole R&D blueprint. Uh, in February itself, there was a global meeting on research and development for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. It also uh, laid bare the underlying vulnerabilities and disparities, which we all knew, but we seldom paid attention to. So we all talk about protecting the vulnerable, but actually during the pandemic response, the global uh, society really fell short of really protecting our vulnerable. The role of health systems in need of essential services, I don't think so I need to explain to the audience that how important it is. And one of the underlying vulnerabilities in our health systems was continued and enhanced investments in uh, sustainable health systems while we've been talking about uh, sustainable health systems, universal health coverage, the, all the, the cube of the UHC is known for quite a number of years now, but when it came to actually responding during a pandemic, it fell short. However, countries who had invested in healthcare systems, and Sri Lanka was one of them, and there are others, lesser known countries, who have actually done well in terms of the pandemic response. Preparedness, as I alluded to that, the, the world was grossly underprepared for a pandemic. While we have been talking about investing in uh, disaster preparedness and response, the preparedness fell seriously short. And even now there is more into response. And I think so we need to, uh, drive home the point that preparedness is the key. And while we respond and recover from the pandemic, we need to actually start to look at preparedness very, very seriously. Whole of government and whole of society. This is again, we have been talking about an inclusive approach to health and development, but this pandemic brought, uh, drove home, home the point that having uh, leadership, uh, keeping politics outside, having a response which is driven by public health and science is critical to success of a response. And in most of the countries where the response failed, it was when science was derided and public health was set aside in favor of political expediency. The role of communities, there have been many unsung heroes of the pandemic and each and every one has played a role and I think so it has brought the best of the society and unfortunately also the worst of society. The notion of having to have social measures like you know, physical distancing, wearing a mask, hand hygiene, not making a crowd, drove home the point that how do we balance the individual rights and freedoms versus collective responsibility and common good and there has been a lot of discussion and debate globally about it. And just to have uh, the public respond to the government's call on wearing a mask and not making a crowd or maintaining physical distancing, it, they sound very simple, but they have been the most difficult of measures to adopt and to implement. Uh, next, please. So moving on to... Um, so we have been running after what we call the economic growth, the GDP numbers, and somehow the global community has lost track of what is sustainable development. So while we look at those business models that, uh, that forces enterprises and individuals and societies to chase that magic economic growth figures. And um, if any one of you has heard um, the emergencies director from WHO, Dr. Mike Ryan, 
And he's, he actually quotes this that, is it actually, for him, he says, it's for me a malignancy and not a growth. And this is a time, it's high time that we really, we really start looking at what is growth and what we define as growth. And is it only for the people without having, including the biome around us, the planet on which we live, that is the inclusivity that we really need to focus on rather than individual success stories, be it for individuals, communities, families, societies, or countries. And the nation state, the whole universal interconnectedness, the globalization and how the interdependence is, is very much dependent on how we, you know, how we treat out the biome around us and health of the people and planet cannot be separated. The other important lesson is the adaptability and the agility. As the pandemic evolved, it was imperative for individuals, how we adapted, I think so as individuals, we adopted to the new normal of staying indoors, not going out of, you know, having that social connectedness, but physically distant, actually meeting people became a matter of concern. And how rapidly the systems were able to respond because in no country, the pandemic had a kind of a pretty predictable curve. All models initially that were there actually fell flat in terms of their predictions. When a new outbreak would happen, how would you do it? I mean, and, this, and the pandemic is still evolving. We are still, I think so, we are at the end of the beginning. We are nowhere near the uh, beginning of the end of the pandemic. And that's why moving forward, this will be extremely important how we make our systems adaptable and agile so that they can respond effectively to these changing scenarios. And in Sri Lanka itself, the first presentation from Dr. Herath was we heard, we have seen how the epi curve has evolved and that requires agility and adaptability in terms of systems response. And unfortunately, most of our public systems, be it financing, be it governance, be it anything, they are not geared towards uh, agile and adaptable functioning. The use of technology. I think so. We have, all of us globally have not used global technology as much as it has been used in the past one year during the pandemic. Um, from, you know, schools moving to Zoom to meetings moving to Zoom, work from home, digital, uh, I mean, online deliveries, digital payments. There has been so much of an expansion of digital technology. And I think so we've been talking about this platform economy, platform growth, platform learning, and the pandemic has forced us to really rapidly adapt and advance the, the technology. And I think so moving forward, we need to build on these things. Um, also in terms of, next please, I, sorry. Uh, also we need to, um, Look at, as I mentioned, the solidarity and the best of humanity was brought out. People helping each other, uh, the societies coming together, even during lockdowns, the way people have helped each other, uh, providing uh, for services for those who are vulnerable or those who are, have, those who are alone. There has been a lot of solid solidarity at family level, at community level, at the level of um, local as well as national and as well as global solidarity. And as I said, the best of humanity has been brought out by the pandemic. Unfortunately, one underbelly of the pandemic has been this infodemic. And this has been fueled by the social media as this was the first pandemic in the age of social media and the way misinformation and disinformation was propelled actually had a huge impact on uh, the interventions that were needed and sometimes or actually most of the time fueled the pandemic and actually helped the virus rather than people and also fueled a lot of stigma and discrimination from discriminating against places where virus was spreading to people who were living in those uh, societies uh, to actually having a person being diagnosed with that, even health workers who are the heroes of the pandemic, they were discriminated uh, because of the fear that they are carrying the virus. And as I said, we it defined the normal for us. 
And the question I would like to leave with the audience is that, do we want to go back to the normal we left behind in 2019? Was it the best normal we had? Or do we use this opportunity to redefine, to reset, to recalibrate what normal should look like where we focus on a inclusive, cohesive uh, development that leaves no one behind? And one question is that after having all these conversations and discussions during the pandemic, once and I mean, hopefully we will see the end of the pandemic, how soon or how later depends on how we move forward, but will we learn and adopt moving forward? Next, please. So quickly coming to what next, as I said, the pandemic is still there amidst us and there's uncertainty how it would continue to evolve. And uh, while there is a lot of hope with the vaccine rollout, uh, which has been highly inequitable, but because we have little information in terms of whether uh, the vaccine would prevent the spread of the uh, epidemic, uh, spread of the virus, because we do not have data on its impact on transmission. However, it has shown that it reduces the number of deaths. We have seen this data coming from countries that have, uh, have, have had a significant population level coverage of vaccine, but the social measures will have to continue. And everyone is tired of these restrictions and social measures, but this is a critical moment in the pandemic response the behavior of the citizens and how if, uh, effectively and diligently they respond to the call of the governments and uh, the public health professionals on uh, the social measures would hugely impact uh, how the pandemic evolves and are, do we help ourselves or we help the virus moving forward. The decisions of the governments because of the economic distress that the pandemic has brought about uh, there would be a lot of pressure on the governments to start the economies and uh, where there have been lockdowns to also come out of the lockdowns earlier and maybe where the, the systems are not geared towards or prepared for a, uh, a sudden spurt in the number of cases will hugely impact on the trajectory of the pandemic moving forward and whether there'll be a global cooperation and solidarity. Would those advances and tools and technologies be shared? If not, if there are few countries, high income ones who have access to all the new technologies, it would be a long, long time before we see the end of this pandemic. As I said, the virus doesn't respect boundaries, it doesn't discriminate, and it will move from one to the other. And it is impossible for countries to stay in isolation forever. The virus evolution, we have already seen a lot of discussion in terms of the variants of interest, variants of concern, and uh, the more the virus is moving within people, the more ha it has the chances of evolving. So will we be able to uh, stop the chains of transmission and stop the movement of the virus from one to the other so that not only we take care of the epidemic and transmission, but also uh, respond, uh, also not allow the virus the opportunity to evolve. Then uh, I've talked about the equitable access to vaccines, and this has been a lot of discussion, be it the G7 or the UN Security Council special session. There has been a lot of calls on having uh, a global solidarity for equitable access, because we need to vaccinate at, some people in all the countries and not just focus on all people in a few countries because virus anywhere is a threat everywhere and no one is safe until everyone is safe. Effectiveness and immunogenicity of the vaccines would largely be driven by the development of the variants. And if we come across a variant with immune escape, there's already a lot of discussion in, uh, for the variant that has been identified in South Africa we still we are awaiting more data out of uh, the studies that would be that would be done but this would be really critical that we have to act now to prevent the spread of variants otherwise it would be very difficult to control the pandemic moving forward and um, 
then looking again at health and socioeconomic recovery, how do we ensure that we have a more inclusive uh, recovery, both for health as well as socioeconomic, because there's a huge chance that we would be increasing the disparity. We have already seen data on uh, in increased job loss losses, increased job insecurity and increased poverty. Next, please. So in terms of um, what should be done, in 2021 that we have, WHO has come up with these priorities for the strategic preparedness and response plan for COVID-19. And it's not, uh, uh, I mean, there's, there are no guesses or no surprises here. Suppressing transmission, reducing exposure, countering misinformation, disinformation, focusing on the vulnerable and with the vaccines as well as the interventions to reduce death and illness because still it continues to be high and the equitable access. Next, please. So what could be the two potential scenarios? I mean, of course, it's optimistic and pessimistic. An optimistic scenario would be an effective virus control in every country to achieve pandemic control, uh, which would include uh, not only equitable and rapid access to effective vaccines globally, but also uh, global solidarity uh, to, ta to tackle the emerging variants and also to have more equitable distribution of newer technologies moving forward. Uh, it will not give us a quick fix to the pandemic. It would still take time, but this would be the best case scenario moving forward. The pessimistic would be increased nationalism and reduced solidarity that will allow the virus variants to develop. And if there's an immune escape, we will need to have second, third generation vaccines. Again, those vaccines with the inequity would be more for the high income countries leaving lower income countries behind. Next, please. So we have a huge opportunity, and this is my last slide, to invest in health systems and preparedness and resilience to respond to future emergencies, but also to other health conditions, capitalizing on the investments uh, on the COVID-19 enhancements like surveillance lab, risk comps, and other core capacities, and to steer the resources for the future health needs. We, we saw the importance of genetic sequencing, for example, use of IT for contact tracing, building on the innovations uh, for also addressing other public health problems. One major um, you know, opportunity and collateral benefit, if I may use that term, is this focus on mental health and psychosocial well-being, as well as the need to invest in chronic care because these were the vulnerabilities that the pandemic exposed amongst others, the need for multi-sectoral collaboration. And last but not the least, and the most important of all is community empowerment and engagement from policymaking down to implementation monitoring. It would be extremely important and recovering better and stronger together for resilient and sustainable health systems, societies and economies this is our opportunity moving forward. Thank you very much. Over to you, Professor Vajira. Thank you, Ras. Thank you, Rasia, for uh, bringing out the uh, various dimensions of uh, the response and also highlighting the, um, you know, the multitude of um, uh, issues that are facing us. Um, let me try to uh, pick up a few questions uh, popping up in the chat, and as you go on, as we go on. Uh, if um, uh, people, well, we have about 10 minutes um, uh, uh, were to put their questions on the chat, I will uh, take it up from there and uh, present. Uh, this question, I think, is the uh, million dollar question, as it were, to Dr. Hemant uh, Why prioritize the 30 to 60s? Um, over to you, Dr. Herath. Yeah, as uh, in the chat box also, uh, the, Dr. Pat Meshran also has uh, indicated in uh, his uh, small statement there. Uh, the initially uh, it was uh, mentioned that it was going going to the vaccine is going to reduce only the um, severity of the disease, but later the gradually the evidence is gathering uh, where that uh, uh, the spreading also can be uh, and the transmission also will be affected. Uh, so uh, uh, um, the, at present uh, there are large number of. Uh, I mean, uh, the, what is the epidemiology unit, unit has identified is that uh, the, the most of our cases present.
actively, uh, I mean, the cases, I did active people, and therefore uh, reducing the transmission. For, uh, we have uh, proposed two aims in vaccination. One is uh, the reducing the complications and deaths, and the other one is the reduce. Uh, I mean, the, uh, try, try to control the transmission as well. So uh, the uh, the finally, we, it was decided that. Um, both uh, the the old age and the comorbid people, plus that uh, those who are actively uh, economically active and active group of people also need to be vaccinated parallelly. So that is why, and also the government factories owners and other industrialists also have proposed that they will fund the uh, vaccination program and they will to, uh, pro provide the funds for vaccination and uh, uh, requested the government to do it. And taking all this into account, it was uh, initially decided to uh, have this, uh, everybody above 30 would be vaccinated. And uh, however, uh, our main limitation, limiting factor nowadays is the availability of vaccines. And therefore, we have to identify specific places. And by doing so, uh, we are have to from time change our uh, strategy. This is how it came into the scene. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, so I think that strategy is uh, clear and there would always be debates as to whether that is the correct strategy. Um, uh, but um, then, of course, uh, now we've gone to the public in uh, Colombo um, uh, with vaccines uh, uh, and vaccination program is being rolled out to the public in Colombo. Are there any other parts of the country uh, where you are planning or you have prioritized that it would um, go to the, uh, that you would um, make the offering to the public. Um, uh, Andy, for example, maybe one of those uh, hotspots as it were. Yes, basically the, our uh, main target up to now is to cover the Western province, focus on uh, Gampaha, Colombo and uh, Colombo CMC area and uh, and not the last, but uh, the uh, the Kalutra uh, the district as well, so that the western province will be covered. Uh, we, we want to cover the, the majority of the people in the western province uh, before the new year, because the, we are expecting a large number of, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, outbound uh, 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 movement of people during the new year time, and there will be another escalation of cases like what happened after the new year and the Christmas. So uh, the Western province will be the one that will be focused. But depending on the availability of vaccines, uh, if we get much more larger quantities, uh, because we are expecting uh, uh, around 10, 000, uh, 10 million vaccines, we, uh, I mean, we have funds available for at least up to that level. So therefore, uh, depending on the availability of vaccines, we might go beyond that. But at this moment, we are focusing on the Western province. Thank you, Hemanta. Let me move on to uh, Rasia. I'm kind of paraphrasing some of the questions which are coming and, uh, you know, trying to get uh, a common answer that will, uh, you know, uh, serve uh, the questions that have been posed. Uh, what are the strategies, Rasia, that countries have used to uh, procure vaccine? Um, was there an option of pre-ordering them? Is there some pool procurement uh, that's happening? Um, things like this. Um, uh, can you enlighten us? Uh, because I think, um, you know, WHO must be playing a role uh, on uh, the procurement side to ensure that there is equitable distribution of vaccines across the countries. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a very important and critical question. And I think so the whole uh, idea behind developing the COVAX facility, which was co-led by WHO, Gavi, and CEPI was to ensure equitable access. And this was lessons learned uh, from uh, the H1N1 uh, when it came that there was holding and access to vaccine was only for the developed countries. And uh, so that was the, the core attempt was to have more equitable uh, access to vaccines. And initially for the COVAX facility, I think so that's the only pool procurement that I know of, although there was some... Uh, uh, exa I mean, some news item I saw that there is some pool procurement for Africa, but none that uh, I have seen actually uh, access vaccines and distribute to the country. 
the various mechanisms for accessing vaccines for countries. So one is that, uh, and that's why the COVAX facility, it's been signed up by 190 countries and 92 of those are advanced market commitment, meaning thereby these economies, these are low uh, middle income economies, they will get the vaccines at no cost because for this, the funds have been raised. In terms of the um, division of labor, WHO is largely responsible for the technical guidance and the regulatory pathways for um, accelerating accelerated uh, approvals or emergency use listing, and also preparing countries and supporting them for the regulatory approval, because that's one very important component on access to vaccines. Gavi uh, is, does the main, main procurement uh, through all these um, advanced market commitment, the memorandum of understandings, so currently the COVAX facility has uh, agreements up to 1.8 billion doses for 2021. And uh, this is for the 92 AMC countries and that would cover almost 20% uh, of the priority populations. The other things which, can, uh, I mean, most of the advanced economies had direct uh, MOUs with the, and they had pre-ordered doses even before the phase three uh, efficacy readout were available for the vaccines. And so there are actually uh, additional doses that uh, these countries have. So um, now, even now the LMIC countries are also actually directly ordering with the manufacturers. And there, then it is a price negotiation as well as availability. And as we know, the supply is far more, uh, the demand is far more than the supplies. So there is a, 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 a competition of sorts. And even COVAX has not been able to get uh, the number of vaccines that are needed um, to, to distribute. And hopefully this week, we will have some deliveries coming out of the COVAX. The third uh, option available is dose sharing. And this COVAX is also trying to get, and some countries have already committed. For example, France President uh, Emmanuel Macron has committed that 5% of the excess doses that France has ordered would be given to COVAX. And some countries are having bilateral deals with countries who have uh, pre-ordered large number of doses to either buy from them the excess doses or have them as donation. And last but not the least, the way uh, Sri Lanka got it is the friendly donation from countries that are either manufacturing or having uh, extra doses. Over to you, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, thank you very much, Rasa. That was um, a comprehensive answer. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, thanks. Uh, moving on to um, um, Hemanta. Um, uh, Hemanta, I think the concern uh, having, uh, you know, uh, started offering uh, the vaccine to uh, those uh, in the age of 30 to 60 is what about the elderly? Um, are we now um, not vaccinating them? Um, uh, what's the situation there? Uh, in fact, uh, the, the the current uh, current strategy is uh, going uh, both groups parallelly. However, the at this moment uh, it is uh, because of the the, the 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 more evidence is towards that. Uh, I mean, uh, about the vaccine is towards the the prevention of uh, deaths and complications and more vulnerable populations. So therefore, it was decided to focus nowadays mainly on the above 60. That is why currently, even though we started doing both uh, over 60, uh, the, the 30 to 60 and over 60 parallelly, uh, it was found that as somebody in the chat box also has found that more vulnerable, fragile people had to stay in the queue. And so therefore, much now it will be more uh, focused on above 60 and uh, uh, but there will be parallel activities going on uh, with, with the availability of more new stocks to cover the the, the government uh, uh, agencies and other frontline staff who are more vulnerable and we need to make sure that they too are protected and therefore cannot be, I, uh, I mean, you cannot uh, isolate and say that you are going to be social aspect also there. So therefore, develop device the methods to overcome such uh, problems. But finally, our aim is to uh, vaccinate almost all, everybody uh, above 60 or 30, uh, because economic 
basically active population also need to be i mean empowered and strengthened uh, i mean and also the the more vulnerable elderly and comorbid population need to be um, uh, i mean protected so therefore uh, what we also always advocate is to go parallelly we will try to make this practically when it goes to the field uh, you it is extremely people and say that today you are going to get that is a, a practical issue so uh, we are trying to accommodate as many people as possible and that is why uh, the the crowd is also there and um, uh, what, what is required is to educate the people and uh, uh, request them to be patient and then Uh, come to the get the vaccination because everybody is going to get it. That is our, uh, I mean, our intention as well as the policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Hemant. We are one minute uh, past eight uh, thirty. Um, uh, uh, Professor Darmaratne has been uh, uh, waiting on the sidelines. Uh, um, so let me uh, ask uh, Professor Darmaratne: Is there anything that you would like to add to this discussion? as a final parting word um, before we uh, wind up for tonight um uh, samat do you have any uh, reflection oh. just on the related thing to i think prevention we have to do so uh, my only sort of uh, comment is aren't we uh, keep uh, sort of putting too much of a uh, sort of uh, belief in the vaccine which might basically affect our preventive things like hand washing social distancing wearing a mask because people might slowly get this uh, false sense of uh, uh, sort of uh, confidence that after you get the vaccine uh, you might not get the disease and uh, this might sort of uh, cause uh, uh, the spread increase the spread because vaccine is initially does not prevent spread so i i basically my plea or my humble request is uh, from both the who as well as the ministry of health to basically uh, increase uh, the informing of the public that they must uh, sort of even before they got the vaccine they have to continue and do preventive measures please don't stop preventive measures and the vaccine will uh, basically not prevent spread because otherwise we might have a sort of a backlash we are we know now a lot of people who have got the vaccine including my friends are starting going on trips so we have to stop that rajani thanks for giving me this opportunity um uh, thank you samat i think uh, uh, we um, uh, that's a good note to um, wind up the discussion on we got to stress uh, continue to stress on the uh, public health measures um, as the vaccines are rolled out rolled out and to um, ensure that we continue our vigilance uh, so with that um, thank you very much uh, for everyone who participated and i would like to um, hand over the mic to the uh, president of the sri lanka medical association uh, dr padma gunaratna uh, to officially thank everyone and um, uh, to wind up uh, tonight uh, dr gunaratna over to you Uh, thank you, Vajra. Thank you very much. I mean, first of all, let me thank Vakras Vajra Virus Vajra Desanayak for this uh, excellent uh, being a moderator and me keeping it uh, so much sort of an interactive session. The webinar was so informative, and it gave us uh, information of the large amount of activities that had been carried out by the Ministry of Health. And from Samat, it was very uh, a sort of uh, heartening to note that this i mean what uh, we are in our day to day practice is in so much in touch with health but then this goes beyond health and uh, how it affects the health, uh, the social life as well as the uh, uh, economy and uh, the uh, rasia thank you very much for this uh, uh, very informative uh, information that you have given to us with regard to global response preparedness and the uh, how the new normal i mean has to be defined i mean the they all have sort of a provoke uh, the th- i mean sort of a, the new thinking process of what the normal that we thought 
as normal in the past and whether we need to rethink and define the normal. So I think all in all that we have had a very interesting webinar. Uh, let me thank all three resource persons, Vajira, as well as all who uh, join us online. Thank you very much. Good night.